All right. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, grab them and turn with me to John chapter 1 this morning, John chapter 1. We are looking together at John's gospel to prepare our hearts for Christmas this year. Uh, And at the same time, beginning a longer journey, uh, we're going to walk through this gospel together, moving through into 2021. And as we do so, uh, we will get to know Jesus at a deeper level level. And, and that is John's goal, right? He, his, his goal is that we'll see Jesus, that we'll behold him, that we'll know him, that we'll believe in him. And believing in him, we will have the life that, that he has made us for. And so um, you'll remember last week we started out the gospel and, and John very, just at, at the outset, wants us to see Jesus for who he is. Right? Jesus is God in the flesh. And so we saw three things in particular. John, or John says Jesus is the Logos. Jesus is the life. The Logos being the Word, right? Revealing, uh, re, you know, Jesus revealing God to us. And then Jesus is the light. And we, as we close, we said we're going to spend some time this week looking at that thought and that idea. Jesus is the light. In fact, eight times in six verses here in John chapter 1, uh, they're going to make reference to that light in some fashion. And so let's look at our passage this morning. Uh, we're going to backtrack just a little bit to verse 4, just to give you the context, reading through verse 13 this morning. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, And his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let us look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege we have of gathering on this Lord's Day to worship you. I know we say it week after week, but you alone are worthy of honor and glory and praise. And I ask that you might prepare our hearts now uh, to worship you in truth, in spirit. Prepare us to receive your word. Lord, we thank you for how you speak to us. We, We know as we celebrate this Christmas season that you are a God who cares. You are a God who comes, and Lord, you care enough to not only come, but to speak into our lives. Lord, your word is living, and it's powerful, and it's exactly what we need this morning. So I ask that you might now, at this time in our service, just block out all the other cares and concerns, and help us to focus intently on what you have for us this morning from your word. We pray, Father, that you may speak. Lord, that You would give us eyes to see wondrous things from your word, ears to hear. And Lord, as a result, may we see Jesus more clearly. May we see who he is, and may our hearts just grow in in our longing for him. May we know him more deeply, and may we walk more faithfully. Father, forgive us. And as we come and we ask that forgiveness, Lord, we recognize we deserve none of it. We don't deserve your salvation. We don't deserve forgiveness. But you, by your grace, have given it all. And I pray for anyone who's listening this morning who's yet to experience that life in Christ for themselves. May today be the day that they see their need. They see Jesus for who he is. And they experience new life and new birth in Christ. Lord, as we read just a moment ago, this is your work. Salvation belongs to you, and anyone who believes and receives comes through you. So, Father, we ask that you might draw and you might work to accomplish your purpose in this place, not only here, but all around the world today as the gospel is proclaimed. Lord, I ask that you would uphold the pulpits of of faithful men 
who are proclaiming your word. Give them grace and strength as they speak, boldness to proclaim the truth. And Father, we pray that your kingdom, Lord, that it would grow and increase this day. And that Jesus Christ would be lifted high and your glory might fill the earth. We ask these things today in Jesus' name. And amen. Well, the prophet Isaiah actually described the days that John is writing about uh, here in John chapter 1. In fact, Pastor Troy read it in our call to worship this morning, all the way back in Isaiah chapter 9. Again, 700 years before this time, the prophet writes, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. So as John writes about this light coming into the world, well before that time, the prophet Isaiah said, those days when this light shines, those people dwell in a land of darkness. And not only do they dwell in a land of darkness, but they themselves walk in darkness. And that was the condition of the world in which Jesus Came a land, a world filled with darkness. You might say, well, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean that the world was in darkness and they walked in darkness? When we see that, when we see that word in the scripture, it always has a negative connotation. Every single time. And, and, And so the implications of that are actually many. When we think about darkness, spiritually speaking, we're talking about a world that was in ignorance. They were in the dark, so to speak. Right? And, and so, you know, Ephesians 4, 18 says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. So in one sense, to be in darkness is to be blind to the truth. John is later on going to say, Jesus, Jesus is going to say, I am the Truth, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But to be in darkness means you're blind to that truth. You do not see it. 2 Corinthians 4 says Satan has blinded the minds of those who believe not, that they will not see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. So in one sense, to be in darkness is to to be unable to see and to know who Jesus is and what he has done. So this light comes into the world, into this darkness, and they do not comprehend, they do not understand who he is. There's another sense when we see that word darkness in which we understand that it's a reference to sin. That people are enslaved to sin. Uh, The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 5.11, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. So works of darkness, sin, right? Anything we do that does not please God, that violates his word. That's what sin is, right? Transgression of the law. And so there's another sense, when Jesus enters into the world, the world is filled with sin everywhere, on every hand. And that is, uh, the third thing we find when we look at the scripture and we think of darkness, is it is under the domain of Satan. And and again, listen, Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Now, so there's a sense in which the world we live in is still under this darkness, right? Under the, the Apostle John writes in 1 John 5, 19, we know we are from God. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. There's a sense in which the world we live in today is still under the dominion of Satan, God has allowed him to, little, little g, little God of this world, to reign for a time. And in this kingdom of darkness, spiritual and moral sin prevail. And I don't think anybody's arguing with that today. I, I, I think, if you're listening to me this morning, you see it. You see the darkness that that is still present in the world in which we live. Sin, spiritual ignorance, and Satan's domain, all alive and at work. I I was just thinking about this. You know, a little over a month ago, we we had daylight savings time. And they, you know, it starts getting darker earlier and earlier. In fact, today, it's supposed to get dark. Sunsets at 5.04. 
You guys, if you're not, if you're listening online, everybody groaned. <laughs> How many of you have a hard time with that? Almost everyone, right? I struggle with it too. And, and you know, the, the truth is this, there are really, there are very real physical and emotional effects to that darkness. <laughs> you, you may experience, um, every year this happens, as, as daylight savings come, it comes and we experience a little less light, fatigue, anxiety, depression. Right? These are real effects, right? And the longer you're exposed to the darkness, the worse those symptoms become. They've run experiments, right? Light deprivation. This is a form of torture, right? To remove someone from the light and, and put them in a dark place. Uh, I, I, I've only had a couple times in my life where I've been in pure, absolute darkness. A few years ago, Amy and I took an anniversary trip, and we went to Louisville, Kentucky, and they have underground caverns that run under the city. And so we went down there. Absolutely fascinating, but there's a part where they take you back on this tour, and it is it's pitch black, you're underground, and they turn all of the lights out. And, and you can't see anything. You can't see your hand. You, you're, you, even as you stand there for a bit and your eyes adjust, you still can't see. It's just pitch black. And there's something uneasy about that, isn't there? Right? There, there? You can almost feel the darkness. And the truth is, the world we live in, spiritually speaking, is in that is in that condition. It's dark. And, and, and so what we find, when we, when, even in the, in the natural world, is that light is necessary, right? That, that light is necessary for life and for health. If there's no light, then we're in trouble physically. We're in trouble emotionally. And, and spiritually speaking, the correlation holds. We need light for a life. And thankfully, brothers and sisters, there is a light. And that's what John is telling us, right? John says, Jesus is the light. That's what he wants us to see in our passage this morning. We, we saw it last week, speaking of this word, this logos, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. Isn't that good, glorious, great news this morning? Do you see it? Behold the light. That's what John wants from us, right? First of all, to see the light. So we're going to walk through this together. Verses 6 through 9, that's the emphasis. Let us see. Let us see this light for who he is. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, if it weren't for the repeated usage of that word light, this passage would seem really disconnected. If you're reading through John's prologue, it's all about Jesus. And then he mentions this man, John, and, and it, it doesn't seem quite like it fits. Um, but what John is doing here, John the author, John the writer, is he's, he's going to outline for us the rest of the passage. So when he mentions John the Baptist... There's a purpose behind it. So as we move ahead through this chapter, we're going to see, right, John is not that light. Right? And, and so there would have been those that John was writing to who still would have held a very high view of John the Baptist. And so he's saying, listen, John was not that light, but he came to bear witness about that light. And that's going to carry us through. In a few weeks, we'll look at who John is and, and, and what these things are saying about him. But the purpose for which he is writing, that all may believe in the true light. And so that's going to outline the rest of the chapter. But for this morning, it's enough for us to know. We're not going to dig into who John is and why he came, because we're going to get there in a few weeks. But it's enough for us to know this, that God sent John to bear witness about the light. The, the reason, the purpose for which he came was that there were those in darkness, and God wanted to make sure that they did not miss this light, that they see it. They don't, and, and so that's, the, that's what's happening here. God has sent this man to say, hey, right, don't look at me. Look at him. Isn't that what happens here in a, a few verses later? Right, he must increase. I must decrease. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we read in verse 9 about this light. 
that, that John has come to bear witness to. He says, it is the true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This dark, sin-sick, fallen world comes light. And it's really a parallel between what we'll see next week in verse 14. The word became flesh. This light was coming into the world. It's talking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Light entering into darkness. And there's a bit of a challenge here when we come to verse 9, at least interpret, interpretation-wise. If you're following along in your KJV, it reads a little different than the way in which I read it in my ESV. And either, one, either translation is possible. So we just kind of ask ourselves a question. Right? So you'll see that phrase, coming into the world. Right? Does that go with every man, everyone, or does it go with the light? Right? And so you'll see the KJV puts it with everyone or every man, Every man come into the world has been enlightened. The ESV and really all other modern translations are going to put it with the light. The light has come into the world. Now, I'm not a Greek expert, but from what I understand, right, either one of those translations is possible. All right, so which one is right? Well, I, I, I tend to lean towards all of these modern translations that place it with the light. Again, contextually, I think it fits very well with the incarnation. Verse 14, word become flesh, light come. Right, this is going to be a major theme throughout John's gospel. Jesus has come. All right, so it seems to fit better with the light, the logos, than it does with every man being enlightened. In fact, those who take it that way tend to have a, a wrong view of man and themselves. Right, listen to the KJV. Right? Again, I'm not knocking the translation itself. I just I, I tend to lean the other way. It says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Throughout history, people have read that and said, Well, every man has been given a light, right? a divine spark, so to speak. Right? So that... That God has given, some people call it provenient grace. God has given each man a, a little bit of divine light that they can work their way, find their way to him. Is that what we find when we look at the word of God? That's not what we see at all. What we see is what? Man is totally depraved. Utterly fallen. Now, we don't like that. Nobody likes that. We like to believe that people are basically good. But the Bible says our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we understand the doctrine of total depravity, then it doesn't fit that there's this divine spark. But theologically, this is what the world believes, right? This is what, <laughs> it's what Katy Perry sings. Do you know there's a spark in you? Right? You just got to ignite the light and let it shine. That's, that's a theological statement. There's a light in you. But that's not true, is it? No. No. The light is not lighting every man that comes into the world. The light has come into the world and gives light to every man. That makes more sense. Right? And, and so... What we understand then, this light that comes into the world that gives light to every man is a pure light. It's, it's true. It's genuine as opposed to counterfeit. Right? There, are, there, are, there have been people throughout history who've held themselves up as the light, the way. Satan himself right, has come as an angel of light. But this light is the true light. This Jesus, who has come into the world, this is who you're looking for. If you are spiritually struggling, you're going, I, I'm just in the dark spiritually. I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe you would be in the category of agnostic and say, I just, I, I don't know. Maybe there's someone out there. Maybe there's something, but I don't know. Spiritually, you're in the dark. This is what you're looking for, the true light. If you're listening today and you are, you're just, you're walking in darkness, living in darkness. You are in sin, and you could care less. This is what you are looking for. You're looking for the true light that will allow you to see yourself 
as you truly are. Right? If we're given over to ourselves, we're going to see ourselves what? Well, I'm pretty good. There's a spark in me. <laughs> right? but, but that's not true. And so the true light, the genuine light, allows us to see ourselves as we truly are. D.A. Carson says, John, John's point is that the word who came into the world is the light. The true light, the genuine and ultimate self-disclosure of God to man. This light, Jesus, coming into the world shows us who God is. And God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Time and time again, as men are encountered with the light, the holiness, the purity of God, they crumble on their face before him. If you can come into the presence of God and his holiness does not cause you to fear, then you don't see him. You don't see the true light. You've got in your mind a God that is not true. You have in your mind, you formed in your mind a God who is, right? This is kind of the mindset of, well, you know, God loves everybody. He'll accept you just the way you are. Just come the way you are. And, and, and there's a sense in which, yes, we come. He invites all to come. But it's not okay just to stay the way you are. Because we are sinful. And God is of purer eyes than to look upon evil. Behold the true light. The genuine light that shows us who God is. And this light, not only is it pure, but it's pervasive, right? This light shines on everyone. Everyone. So that all are without excuse. That's important. This light has come into the world and it shines on all, right? No one will die and go to hell and be able to say it's God's fault. No one is going to say, God, you didn't shine your light in my direction. No, <laughs> no, Jesus' incarnation is an invasion of the true light. It shines upon all men. God has revealed himself in such a way that men are without excuse when they stand before him. This is the dividing line, right? This is, what, this is what happens as this light enters into the world. The light is going to shine on us, and it's going to force a distinction. The light shines on every man. And how you respond to the light is what matters. There's two very distinct responses to the light. And, and you, can, you, can, you can understand this as you just think about it, you know, the way you respond to light at different points. If you got up in the... You, such a sweet dad. My son was sleeping this morning. And uh, yeah, I always uh, sing, This is the day the Lord has made on Sunday morning right, to get him up out of bed. That didn't work. He just curled up tighter. And so I did what? I flicked the light on. In that moment, what did he do? Uh, right? He's repulsed by the light. Right? And so some people, when the light shines, are going to be repulsed. Other people are relieved with light. If you're, if you're stumbling in the darkness and you're in danger of falling and there's light, that can be your salvation, right? It's, it's a relief. It's a welcome that it's there. Well, what we find when we understand this true light has entered into the world of darkness, there's going to be two responses. People are either going to be repulsed or they're going to be relieved. And you're going to fall into one of those categories. Right? And we see both. When you look at verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Oh, that's a stunning revelation. Right? The one who made the world and everything in it entered into his creation. This glorious light came into the darkness. And it's certainly, right, we have, we have images throwing us back to Genesis chapter 1 once again. Right? Darkness covered the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light, light entering into the darkness. And as Jesus comes into his creation, he brings a light, the true light, the genuine light, 
But you notice what it says. The world that was made through him did not know him. The light came, and they didn't see. They were in the dark. Spiritually ignorant, didn't recognize that the creator of the universe had come. Really, we have two groups of people here. Right? That's the world, the, the Gentile world. And then, verse 11, he came to his own. His own people, the, the Jewish people who had light, who had revelation throughout the Old Testament telling them what to expect, who would come, how he would come, and they did not see him. They did not receive him. Right? They, the light had come into the world and they were repulsed by the light. Later on in chapter 3, he's going to say what? Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It just, it speaks to the, the tragedy of sin, the wickedness of the human heart. Right? This is how utterly irrational sin is that, that God in love sends, sends his own son into this darkness to save us from our sin, and we say what? Turn out the light. Right? I don't want anything to do with that. I love my sin. I like my darkness. Get away. And they would rather face eternal judgment than have the light of life. It doesn't make sense. It should be a relief. It should be a welcome. And yet they're repulsed by the light. And I see this often as I share the gospel with people. Oh, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with that. You can just tell when somebody hears the good news, the light has come into the world. They immediately shut it down. Or, I don't really need that. I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. Again, if you think you're a pretty good person, then you're not seeing the light for who it is. See, this light has come into the world and they did not receive him. They rejected him. And that's, this is a dangerous thing to do. When the creator of the universe comes into the world and you reject your life and your light, and I would just say to you very plainly this morning, for anyone listening who is yet without Christ, do not say that lightly. This Christmas season, as we celebrate Jesus Christ come to earth to save us from our sin, that you do not reject that lightly. Behold the light. See the light. You may be listening and you're blinded to this truth, but today God would open your eyes to the glorious truth of who Jesus is. Oh, that's our prayer. Our prayer is that if you are here today and you are yet in darkness, that God would allow you to see yourself in your sin, but allow you to see the beauty and the glory of Jesus, who he is, the true light, perfect holiness, who in himself carries life. And if you would believe in him, you will be saved. That's what we see as we move forward, right? See, in contrast, there are those who are repulsed by the light. But then, verse 12 says, To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is the pinnacle of, of, of the prologue. Right, the, the highlight of chapter 1, this is where John is taking us, not only here in the prologue, but through the entire book. If you want to just look at them together, right? Verse 12 says, All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Let me remind you of his purpose statement that he gives at the end of the book in John chapter 20. Do you remember? He says in verse 31, These are written so that you may, what? You may believe, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Verse 12 here of chapter 1 is one of the clearest statements in all of the Bible of the simplicity of how people are saved. 
but to all. To all. Do you hear the, the open invitation? To every one, all who receive him, all who believe in his name. No exclusions. If you will hear, if you will receive, if you will believe, you'll be given the right to become a child of God. You'll be saved. Your sin will be forgiven. You'll belong to him. You'll have life in his name. Receiving and believing really are parallel statements here in verse 12. All right, we, could, we could spend a lot of time trying to make the distinctions of what it looks like. And, and it may be helpful some, to, to think, well, what does it mean to receive Jesus? It's more than just asking him into your heart, right? To receive Jesus is to accept him for who he is. King of kings and Lord of lords, Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To receive Jesus is not to say, well, I'll, I'll take your salvation, but I don't really want you to, to control my life. Right? That's, that's, not, that's not what it means. To receive Jesus is to receive him as he is, for who he is. That he is God. To believe in him. And we're going to talk about this a lot as we walk through John's gospel. What does it mean to really believe in Jesus, to put your faith and trust in him? And we'll look at some examples we walk through. I mean, we know what faith is, right? We know what trust is. We do it all the time. There are countless numbers of you here who plop down in your pew seat this morning without a second thought. You threw all of your weight on that seat knowing, trusting, by faith, that that seat would hold you up. You threw all your weight on it. And that's what it means to believe and to trust. To believe in Jesus is to throw all of your weight on him. No trust in yourself. No trust in anything else, but only Jesus. All right? Salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. And it's by grace alone. And that's what we see in verse 13, right? Do you see it? We have the responsibility of man in verse 12. The responsibility of every man to experience salvation is to believe, to receive Jesus. But then we have the sovereignty of God in verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How does this new birth come about? Well, it's God who works. It's God who saves. We've used this illustration before. We'll, we'll talk about it again as we come to chapter 3, but what part did you play in your birth? None, right? You were there. <laughs> you had no control over that. Well, the same thing is true spiritually speaking. Yes, responsibility of man. You must believe. You must receive. But that comes through God. Not, do you hear these? Not of the blood. What does that mean? No family lines. He came to his own. He came to the Jewish people who thought what? Because I was a Jew and I was born a Jew, then I'm good. Right? I'm one of God's people. And he says, no, not of blood. And not of the will of man, not of the will of flesh. That means that you can't, you can't work your way to God. Right? The will of flesh, you're just going to do it on your own? Doesn't work, right? Because even our good works are filthy rags before a holy God. There's just simply nothing we can do to merit God's salvation. Not of blood, not of the will of flesh, and not of the will of man. There's no human system that will get us to God. There's no religion that will get us to God. Only Jesus only the true light that has come into the world. If you will receive him, if you will believe in him, you will be saved. And this is what we pray for. This is what we long for. Is that If there's anyone listening today whose eyes are still blinded to this truth, that they will see Jesus for who he is. That, that you'll see yourself for who you are, and you'll trust in Christ and Christ alone. See, this light, this light entered into the darkness. But the darkness did not overcome it. He remained pure and holy 
his entire life. Jesus never sinned, not in word, not in thought, not in deed. He lived the life that you and I were meant to live, but did not. He is the true light. This light came into the world and lived that life, a sinless, holy life. But he also died the death that you and I deserve. He came to his own, and his own received him not. It's not that the the light came into the world, and they said, get out of here, right? Get away from me. They took that light, and they beat him, and they spit on him, and they crucified him. That's the epitome of darkness, is it not? That the creator of the world would come into his creation and we did everything we could to snuff it out. But we couldn't. Because Jesus not only lived the life we should have lived and died the death that you and I rightfully deserve. Three days later, he rose victorious from the grave. And in doing so, the light conquers, overcomes darkness, spiritual ignorance, sin, and Satan, so that we can be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. If you are here, or if you're listening today, and you do not know Jesus, then the invitation is clear. He has come. He has shown on you and every man. And if you will believe, and if you will receive him, you will be saved. You'll be a child of God. I told you John's gospel is evangelistic. But he's also speaking to you and I, brothers and sisters. Remember, believing is the condition of our heart forever and ever from now on. This is who we are. We are believers Right? And so as believers, we must trust him. This is the posture of a child of God. So if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, but you find yourself in darkness today, then John's message to you would be what? Believe in the light. It could be the darkness of despair. You find yourself in a situation right now that has left you feeling Hopeless. There's no way out. There's seemingly no light at the end of the tunnel. And God's word to you would be what? Believe in the light. Trust in the light. He has overcome the darkness. If you're in despair this morning, look to Jesus. It may not be the darkness of despair, but it's the deeds of darkness that you find yourself in this morning. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, there's a time where you put your faith and trust in Jesus. And yet you have found yourself in sin. And and you're ashamed of it. Even as we speak of it now, you feel the guilt and the conviction of that sin. Say, what do I do with that? You bring it into the light. As long as you keep it hidden in the darkness that darkness is going to hold sway over you. You bring it into the light. Believe in the light. Trust in who Jesus is and what he has done for you. And you can walk in the light of life. There are some of you this morning who are, you just simply find yourself in the dark. You don't know what to do. Don't know which way to turn. You're not even, you're not really sure what God is doing. And the message to you is the same. Believe in the light. Behold the light. Trust in the light. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light into our path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. You need light in the darkness this morning. Look to Jesus. Be relieved this morning by the light of Jesus Christ. Allow him to shine into your darkness. Trust in him and him alone. Yes, this is a word for unbelievers. 
you're going to respond to this message in one of two ways. You're either going to be repulsed by the light or you're going to be relieved by the light this morning. You're going to say, get that out of here. I don't want to hear that. Or you're going to say, that's what I need more than anything else. But it's also a message for us as his people that we walk in the light and we trust in him and believe in him day in and day out. And because of what's at stake, brothers and sisters, there's one other point we want to see. So we behold the light, we believe in the light, but then lastly, we must be a witness to the light. Right? We saw John sent by God. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light in verse 7, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And the truth is, brothers and sisters, like John, God has sent us into the world. In fact, later on, Jesus is going to say, as, as I was sent, so send I you. Jesus at one point in John chapter 8 says, I am the light of the world. But then he says what? You are the light of the world. Brothers and sisters, we do live in a world of deep darkness. That is spiritually ignorant, set on sin, and under Satan's domain. And they need Jesus. They need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. They need the light. And you have it. You have it. Will you let your light shine this week? The light of Christ? As you go to, to work, as you, as you encounter neighbors, I know it's a difficult time to witness right now, but it's possible. This Christmas season, people are... They're more open to hearing. Take opportunities to share the truth, to share the light, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Would you do that this week? Would you be willing to say, Lord, use me to be a light in the darkness this week? That's what this world needs. We see death and disease, and despair everywhere we look. But we have the light. So let us share. As we close this morning, it's possible someone is listening and you find yourself yet in darkness. And today, as a result of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, God has opened your eyes to see Jesus for who he is the light of the world, the Savior, your light, your Savior. And if you will believe and you will receive him, you will be saved. And I want to encourage you this morning, if God is drawing and he is moving and he is pulling you, then respond. Respond. Do not be repelled. Receive Jesus Christ today because apart from Jesus, you will spend eternity separated from God in outer darkness forever and ever and ever in hell. He came to his own. His own received him not. He came into the world. The world did not know him. And if you die without Christ, you will spend eternity in darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Let's look to him in prayer this morning. Father, we... Thank you for this word. It's a word that gives us great hope as your people. We see the world we live in, and sometimes it, it's so hard to see the condition that it is in, and yet you are the light, a light that shines in the darkness, a light that brings life and hope to us as your people. And we thank you for it. We thank you that you've shown in our own hearts that you open our blinded eyes, that we would see Jesus for who he is and we would see ourselves for who we are. That there was a day where I recognized my own sin and saw my need of a Savior and put all my trust in Christ and in doing so, became your child. I don't deserve any of that, Lord. It's all by your grace. 
And I pray by your grace this morning that you may draw more to yourself. That you might open blinded eyes and we would see new birth and new life in Christ today. We give you praise and glory that you would, you would enter into your creation and you would come into this darkness that you might rescue us from our sin. We stand in awe and we give you glory and praise and we ask it in Jesus' name and amen.